Today we'll be finishing out our look at megastructures designed to get people into space by looking at a few more concepts. Our main focus will be on the Lofstrom Loop and Star Tram, but we will also have some miscellaneous systems near the end of the episode, like the Space Fountain. After that we'll be moving on to talk about rotating habitats. Where the first few episodes dealt with megastructures for getting you off of a planet, the next few will be looking at where people would live if not on planets. We won't really be looking at technology dealing with planets in the series after today, except in terms of constructing completely artificial planets. We will look at more planet-based technologies in an upcoming standalone video on terraforming, and we'll continue to look at such things throughout the series on habitable planets. These vary so much from planet type to planet type, though, that it's easier to look at them there individually. Our next video in that series, on rogue planets in the interstellar void, will be coming after the terraforming video, and so as a lead into another standalone video on interstellar colonization. Both of those two videos, terraforming and interstellar colonization, will be summary videos of concept and technology, and so they will be on the longer side, like the original Megastructures video was, or the video on comprehensive solutions to the Fermi Paradox. If you want a reminder when those videos will be coming out, subscribe to the channel by clicking on the logo in the bottom right corner, and you may want to turn on the closed captions for the video while you're down there. Alright, let's get started. The object that's been drifting around the background during the introduction is a Lofstrom loop. It is one of the more popular launch loop concepts. It is essentially a long runway or railroad track hovering 50 miles or 80 kilometers over the ocean, about 1250 miles or 2000 kilometers long. That's high enough to get all the air out of the way, causing the drag on our accelerating ship, but still low enough to enjoy the Earth's protection from space debris. You would usually situate one of these things on the equator, though you don't have to, and those lines running off at an angle are tethers, acting as guy wires to help stabilize it. What keeps it afloat is essentially the same concept as the orbital ring we discussed in episode 1, though it's a bit trickier since it isn't a big circle in actual orbit. Down on the ground, connected to some power plants, our loops where matter is accelerated very quickly and hold up the shaft to the track, running along the track down to the next shaft, which descends into the loop at the other end, which it turns around the matter and throws it back, a twin track running in parallel. These form the tracks the ship runs along like a maglev train, but which you can just keep accelerating the whole way because there's not much air on the way to cause drag. The matter is running down a rotor with a static sheath around it, and that can be superconducting or regular magnets. The design predates superconductors. The matter running down the rotor can either be one long contiguous ribbon of material, like a bike chain or a wire, or it can be a stream of ball bearings. The rotor itself is an evacuated vacuum tunnel. Normally the sheath would be too. Same concept as an orbital ring, but shorter, and you can build it on the ground, and when you power up, it slowly floats up. If a chunk breaks, the rest of the apparatus falls down, but it can be slowed by parachutes. These land on the ocean and float there until you have a new section installed and turn it back on. Conceptually easy, though it is something of an engineering nightmare to build and keep stable. I've seen price tags as low as $30 billion for this, but that's probably being terribly optimistic. I like the orbital ring though, or skyhooks, there's no super science involved here. The science is solid, the engineering is a little less so, but it should be doable. There are a lot of valid engineering problems with these, though I've heard a lot of silly ones too, uh, like how the loop contains as much energy as a nuclear bomb, which is true, but the nature of such a catastrophic failure would be nothing like a nuclear blast. Even ignoring that a nuclear blast spread over a few hundred thousand square miles of empty ocean, minus all the radiation, would not even cause as much damage as a mild thunderstorm. There are some other launch loop designs, but Lofstrom's is the best known, and they all basically parallel the design and concept anyway. Uh, one can make a launch loop shorter in a couple ways. The first is to have a slower final speed, which could be done if the ship was flying off to get hooked by a skyhook at the end of the track. The thing about distance for accelerating objects is that the length of your track, for constant acceleration starting from being stationary, is that it rises with the square of velocity. So if you want to end going twice as fast, your loop needs to be four times longer. Three times as fast, three squared, nine times longer. Ten times as fast, ten squared, a hundred times longer. 
so you could use one of these with a sky hook to cut it down to a quarter as long, maybe shorter. The other way you can get a shorter track is with a higher rate of acceleration. The Lostrum loop calls for a 3G acceleration, which is uncomfortable for people to endure, but not too bad, and they will only feel it for a few minutes. You could scale that acceleration down to 1G, normal with gravity, but then your track has to be longer. A track length for the same final velocity scales inverse to acceleration. Double your acceleration, half the distance of the track length, triplet, a third the distance. 100 times the acceleration, 100 of the distance. Of course, if you did that, the people inside would be feeling 300 Gs of force, which is more than enough to kill you. Anything much over 10 Gs is a bad idea, even for a short time, for people. Bullets routinely undergo tens of thousands of Gs of acceleration in the bay of a gun, but bullets have no hearts, lungs, brains, etc. Even fairly sophisticated electronics can be built to withstand high Gs, which is why we can get away with putting specially designed electronic fuses on artillery shells. So, very short, high acceleration tracks are possible, but only for dumb matter or specially designed equipment, and we tend to refer to these as mass drivers, though you will often hear them called a rail gun, coil gun, electromagnetic catapult, space gun, and so on. There's no rigorous definition for these that excludes lower acceleration versions safe for people to be in, but we also don't call a maglev bullet train a mass driver, and it's the same concept. Startram, our next space launcher, is often called a mass driver, uh, especially the Generation 1 version, which is for cargo only. The Generation 1 Startram design slams a cargo pod down a 80 mile long track at a modest 30 Gs. It starts off inside the atmosphere and has a ship fly down a tunnel from which the air is evacuated. It exits the tunnel, which ends on a mountain peak and which the air is kept out of by a plasma window. Plasma windows, which are basically like a force field on the end of the launch tube to keep the air out, are a pretty neat and uh, new and very energy intensive concept. You can look them up, but for all purposes they are a problem only if they need a lot of energy, and the energy rises with the diameter. Double the diameter, double the power needed. One about 10 meters or a bit over 30 feet in diameter would need a constant power supply of about 8 megawatts, which isn't horrendous, but it's nothing to sneeze at either. Big difference and advantage over the Lostrum loop is that it runs at local ground level up the side of a mountain rather than starting off above the atmosphere. It is simply an evacuated tube you can run down without air slowing you down. This is often called a vacuum train or back train, and your acceleration can be made lower by making the track longer. Vac trains have been long discussed as a way of doing hypersonic travel at low energy costs, and the hyperloop design Elon Musk has proposed is a partial vac train, though it actually runs on an air cushion like an ice hockey table instead of via maglev. Startram's Generation 2 design is basically a tilted Lofstrom loop, in that it's very long and cargo runs at only 2 or 3 Gs along it. The issue with these sorts of launchers is really just about how to keep the top part, up where the air is thinner, from falling down. Early designs for more modest ones had them held up by hot air balloons, for instance. The issue is that not only does air slow you down for accelerating, but when you exit a vacuum tube into normal air, or even fairly thin air at mountain peaks, it's a bit like slamming into a wall at those kinds of speeds. The same as jumping off a diving board into a pool compared with climbing down a ladder into one. These paths for these don't necessarily need to be straight lines either, but straight is generally preferable. Adding curvature adds in engineering complications that probably aren't worth it in most cases. Startram is a very attractive system though, especially used in combination with a space plane with its own engines and a skyhook at the end. It requires some precision timing and some proportion to allow you to maneuver, but if you miss the skyhook you can always fly off to land at a normal airport and try again. The Startram Generation 1.5 system embraces this idea, calling for a 3G acceleration down a track about 200 miles long, any on a mountain peak where the ship exits and links up to a skyhook. Based on the current engineering, that system will reduce fuel costs for getting into orbit to about 1% of normal, and is something we have the technology to build, and could probably do so for a price tag in the upper tens of billions to lower hundreds of billions. Hypothetically as little as NASA's annual budget, but more likely you'd be talking about a decade-long project that would cost about as much as NASA's annual budget to maintain each year. 
If I had to guess as to a space launch system we'd be likely to employ in the not too distant future, excluding any major breakthroughs that change the game entirely, then I would bet on something along these lines. Probably a shorter and slightly higher acceleration tunnel rising up to a mountain peak then linking up to a skyhook. One big thing against it is that this stuff is always best done on or near the equator and west to east, and there aren't a lot of mountains in the United States on the east coast, and you really do want to exit over an ocean or at least uninhabited land if you can. Conveniently, you do tend to have higher mountains near equators, which is not entirely coincidental, but I won't go into that now. Unfortunately, none of the countries on Earth with the sorts of industrial and technological muscle to be looking at building such a thing happen to have a convenient east coast mountain near the equator, making it a less desirable option to them. Now, there are a number of other ideas that get kicked around that are very similar to launch loops, skyhooks, space elevators, or orbital rings, and we've already gone long for this video, but I want to give a quick honorable mention to the Space Fountain, as it's probably the only commonly named megastructure that circulates such conversations, and because the concept gets used in a lot of other big old megastructures. Space fountains are neat ideas. Essentially, it's a vertical structure held aloft by firing high speed projectiles straight up, which gets slowed down along the way. Not just from gravity, but from magnets at the end or along the path transferring the momentum into the structure to keep it aloft. Energy lost to gravity gets regenerated on the fall back down, though some have suggested that you might not even want to have the metal come back down, especially initially, and just use it for construction material to build the tower higher, or to build things up there. It's a launch loop in the idea that holds it up, and an orbital ring in that it's a high structure that remains right over the same place. They're not very good for space launches unless you build them thousands of miles high, in which case they are a space elevator that doesn't rely on tensile strength, but they are ideal for holding up structures that are far taller than you can build from conventional materials. That means you can use them to hold structures aloft, like pylons for a bridge, and you can build a lot more redundancy into both them and whatever they are holding up as a result. So space fountains could, for instance, be used to hold up a vac train tunnel and be spaced close enough together to give it redundancy if one fail was always attacked and blown up. They could be included as part of an orbital ring, too, as a failsafe, and they have the advantage that you can add segments to increase height as you go, growing them from the ground floor up. They also allow you to skip on symmetry, so you could use uh, them to build a curved or helical launch loop, for instance. We will be seeing this a lot further down the road when we talk about certain megastructures like the Matrioska shell world. Like the orbital ring, space fountains can be used to do things conventional construction materials could never allow. Their obvious disadvantage, though, is that they require a constant power supply to relate, replace lost energy. How much would depend on how efficient the machinery is. Theoretically, one could be 100% efficient and be a closed system, same as an orbital ring, but in practice nothing is ever 100% efficient. You can also play this trick with lasers or microwaves by firing them from the ground to bounce off the underside of a station with a reflective bottom. Same concept. And if the power is cut, the thing just falls down, slowed by parachutes. From here on out, we'll be looking at stuff bigger and further ahead in time, genuine megastructures. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you want alerts when those come out, and like this video and try some of the others on the channel in the meantime. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.